my talk today is probably going to be a little bit, um, I don't know, abstract's probably not the right word, but a little bit of, around um, thinking about how central bankers approach financial stability in terms of the way that we we try to interpret information and make decisions. So a little bit, a little bit less about the things that are necessarily, you know, called directly called financial stability work, and a little more maybe about how it is that um, we'd know if we're doing it right or not. Um, so the Fed, after the the recent crisis, along with a lot of central banks, is trying to strengthen its um, framework for identifying, monitoring, and mitigating risks to financial stability. Um, this is not something that's really new to the Fed. I mean, the Fed new to I mean, trying to do this is not something that's new. Um, some of the ways that we're trying to do it, I think, are new. But I think in, you know, it comes down to the fact that doing good financial stability work is really about identifying and mitigating problems before they result in a crisis. Um, crisis management is a piece of financial stability work once you're in that state, but, but trying to, to avoid getting in that state is also, um, I think, a very big piece of it. Um, in creating the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC, um, the Dodd-Frank Act did strengthen the mandate for coordination on financial stability issues across the U.S. regulatory system. And I'll talk a little bit about um, where that has worked so far, where, where it's been, um, you know, it's, it's, it struggles. It's a bureaucratic process. It's a big set of agencies trying to talk about issues that are in some ways inherent in people's, they have turf ownership over certain issues. But I think it has actually been a very good addition to the regulatory process to have this council meet and discuss some of these issues um, in, a, in a more open and, I, don't know, I guess, a more urgent manner than, than happened before. Okay, so what's, why is the financial system important? You probably you know this, um, but financial systems allocate resources. They channel household savings to corporate sector. They allocate investment funds among firms, they allow people to smooth their income and their spending, sorry, smooth their spending over time, um, depending, you know, with different life cycle of income. Um, and they enable households and firms to share risk, to, you know, for people to sort of pay to have someone else take risk for them, um, risk away from them. So, so these, these are the things that the financial system does, and we think that these things are critical to real to robust and, and um, sustainable real activity. So the financial system is, is not just, um, yeah, it, I think it's gotten in a way, I think even, I, I don't know, internally I would say we struggle a little bit now with how do you draw the line between what is the type of financial activity that is providing a service to the real economy and what is the type of financial activity that is, I'll call it gambling, I don't know, gratuitous, just, you know. So I think there's, there probably is that line somewhere, and maybe you even need the gambling to get the other one. I don't know, but these are, I think, the questions that we're grappling with a little bit in the wake of the crisis. So what is a stable financial system? Um, so the answer is, is C. So it's a system, so, the question, the, so it's, not a, it's not a financial system that's not in crisis because we didn't have a crisis in 2005. Um, and, it, and it definitely was not, as we saw, a stable financial system. Um, it's not a financial system that will never be in crisis because there is something inherent in, in financial transactions that is a sharing of risk, and, and it's possible for people to be you know, caught short or, or get off guard in ways that, that, that are systemic. Um, it, but it is a financial system that's resilient to a wide range of shocks, not all shocks, and it's not itself prone to unsustainable booms or very, you know, costly damaging um, busts. So that said, you know, that's kind of easy to write down. And then sort of what that actually means is, is um, obviously kind of the hard part. So just to illustrate um, one, one thing I think that illustrates a little bit why this is hard. So if you look at um, this two, two quotes by two Federal Reserve chairmen, Chairman Greenspan in 2005, um, he, he described how advances in complex financial products have significantly lowered the cost of and expanded opportunities for hedging risks. These new instruments of risk dispersal have enabled the largest and most sophisticated banks and their credit granting role to divest themselves of much credit risk by passing it to institutions with far less leverage. 
Um, these increasingly complex financial instruments have contributed to the development of a far more flexible, efficient, and hence resilient financial system than, one, than the one that existed just a quarter of a century ago. Um, and he goes on to say that the, you know, the bust of the stock market bubble in 2000, we saw that that didn't have a big effect on the economy. So a little bit of this kind of, we're in a brave new world, the financial innovation is, is um, helping to create a more efficient system and that's obviously helping to, to foster real growth. In 2008, the statement by Chairman Bernanke, who obviously you know, kind of looked at these things from, from the other side by that time, he really talks about the exact same things in a very different way. So more, more fundamentally, the turmoil was the product of a global credit boom characterized by a broad underpricing of risk, excessive leverage by financial institutions, and an increasing reliance on complex and opaque financial instruments. So they were um, complex, but not opaque in, in um, Chairman Greenspan's description. Um, and they've proven to be fragile under stress. Um, the unwinding of this boom has led to, many, to the withdrawal of many investors from credit markets and deleveraging by financial institutions, both of which have acted to constrict available credit to households and businesses. So the system had ceased to perform its function of allocating credit to households and businesses by 2008 for some of the same reasons that it was kind of applauded in 2005. So I think to me this is the, the kind of thing that, that makes me, um, I don't know, worry is not the right word, but we, in 2005 Greenspan, you know, a lot of people agreed with what he was saying and I think there were good reasons. Some of it was, was correct. But just if you think about someone standing there in 2005 saying these things, and then you think about what happened in 2007 and 8 and 9, um, it should give, you, give us pause about our ability to assess what's happening in the moment about future, what, what could possibly lead to instability in the future. I think it's not fair to say that the Fed in 2005 and, and 6 was oblivious to some of the risks that might be created by financial innovation. And I know that Chairman Greenspan did make comments that were along the lines of, you know, people could be, um, there would be maybe people taking on too much risk, a potential for um, risk appetite to shift suddenly and for things to slow down. But I, do, I would say overall, during the period in the lead up to the crisis, the Fed's policy and posture was, um, we kind of bought into, this, what, what's the, I always forget, is it? taped and broadcast all over the world or no? Yeah? Okay, so our policy, no. I, so we, 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 we bought into it, right? So we were part of it in a way. We didn't, we were not able to discern the things that would ultimately be, um, would collapse later, right? And we weren't able to discern with any real clarity what was fundamental and what was, you know, excessive risk taking or, or gambling. Um, so, and, and, all right, so, so I think that's, that's not to criticize the Fed, but that's just to show that this is three years apart, and these are, three, these are two really, really different takes on the exact same thing. And we know, you know, we know now we're still struggling with an unemployment rate that's, that's not back to where it was um, because of some of these events. So the question is, how did we get from the stability of 05 to the collapse of 08? And the reason I'm, I'm asking that question is because I think we have to today ask ourselves, you know, where are we now? Is this 05? Um, I think we have this idea that once the crisis happens, then we're, we get a little reprieve or it's, you know, like, whew, and um, you can't get another bad thing, you know, right now. So how do you, how do you evaluate whether you're looking at the world if, the way you, what you might have wished that people looked at it in 05 and preempted some of this stuff? So that's why I'm going through that process of 05 to 08. So, so one, the IMF um, fact sheet on financial system soundness, not that this is a great authority, but just, the, just to cite something that kind of is a description, weak financial institutions, inadequate regulation and supervision, a lack of transparency were at the heart of the financial crisis of the late 1990s, as well as the recent global financial crisis. So that's true, but it's a little bit hard to know what to do with that. It's kind of a description of, we, we'd missed it, right? But, but beneath the surface, there were thousands of large and small decisions getting made 
you know, every day by borrowers, by lenders, by the financial institutions themselves, by regulators. All these little decisions were getting made, and most of the decisions at the time probably seemed reasonable. They probably seemed, you know, on the margin, yes, this was a good thing. This would make us a little more money. Um, we did, we were holding capital against it. We were able to get the risk off our balance sheet and another entity's holding capital against it. The, this, these things don't, so, so I think the, the problem is that we have assumptions about what's happening in the real economy, so we argued over whether home prices were, um, you know, whether that was a bubble, but there were ways to justify it as not being a bubble. Um, we talked about the benefits of financial innovation and maybe didn't look as much at the risks of financial innovation. We relied on the robustness of securitization markets and didn't ask ourselves, well, maybe that, is that, is that a, something, a service that's going to be there even in times when people are less confident in the presence of, of liquidity in markets to, to transact. So why was it not more evident that we were headed towards a collapse? I think... Um, I don't think there's a, you know, one answer to this, but in large part, I think that many of the vulnerabilities kind of emerged slowly over time, and we hadn't seen them yet. We hadn't seen them manifest themselves yet. So, um, which, of course, is, yeah. <laughs> so the, the problem is, if you have to wait till you see them manifest, then you're maybe not doing such a great job with the financial stability. So that's the, that's the problem. How do you know the vulnerabilities are there before, you, before they've actually manifested in a problem? Um, so there were gradual structural changes in the U.S. system overall, so rise of the, G the importance of the GSEs, um, of the shadow banking system, kind of other, other entities that were um, worked with banks but were not banks, money market mutual funds, um, general wholesale funding markets, so not just retail deposits but all kinds of wholesale deposits and to fund large institutions. Um, and I think the, you know, the net effect, again, this is just a description, is it out it outgrew the defenses against crisis that had been put in place after the, after the depression. Deposit insurance, supervision of banks, um, a resolution regime that was just tailored to closing down banks and maybe not closing down other types of large complex financial, and definitely not closing down other types of large uh, finan complex financial institutions. So I think that's one thing is there were just a lot of things that had changed and people didn't understand those changes. And then I think there's another thing um, and I think it's that we have a tendency as human beings to see um, a robust economic environment uh, as an indication of success of the decision making across all facets of the financial system. So we, we have a tendency to want to congratulate ourselves and to be doing a good job, right? And a good job manifests in, in economic growth and jobs. And um, so I think there's something that we have to be very conscious of that um, we probably don't like to see the, downs the bad side of things as much as we like to see the good side of things. And that's, that's a tendency we have to find ways to lean against in doing financial stability work. And I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's easy to do that. Um, so the, one of the lessons from, so the way I would sort of characterize the lessons from the crisis is that the underlying stability of the system is often difficult to ascertain until it's too late. So we don't, you don't know until it's, um, till, till it's, till the bad things have manifested. So the system can perform well, it can appear stable for long stretches of time, but that apparent stability can be rapidly replaced by instability and impairment. Um, and, and I think another thing that's important is that the degree of stability can't be reliably inferred from levels of spreads, values of, of particular indices, or even from like what the mix of activities are. So you kind of need to not only look at what's happening, what's, what kinds of activities are taking place in the financial system, but maybe go one layer down and understand what are the um, processes that are giving rise to those activities. Are people reading the legal, not you know people, but in these, these transactions, are the legal agreements that are underlying the transactions being you know signed kind of quickly and yeah, I'm sure it's fine, or are people really pouring through those? Do people understand the default triggers and the clauses about when things, um, under what circumstances the contract won't pay? Um, I think this is where if we look at places where there's complexity and opacity and the potential for, the, for that to be masking risk and for, have, and for people to think something is 
um, not worth reading that contract. Anytime people would think it's not worth reading through that contract, um, or I'll take a little yield for a little while and then I'll get out of this thing. Um, I think that's where we need to, to question what's happening in the system on those smaller margins and, and maybe avoid the bigger, the bigger buildups of instability. Um, so, okay, so what is it then that we would look at to understand whether the financial system is stable? So one of them is, you know, what do we know about the private incentives and about the, the quality of the regulation um, that govern the system's activities? Do they generally foster accurate and timely assessments of expected return and underlying risk by borrowers, lenders, and investors? Do, do we, you know, how do we test that? How do we check? And I, and I think there's a, um, well, okay, I'll, I'll get to that. So then another is, would the operational institutional infrastructure allow the system to perform its function even if there was a large shock um, or a sustained period of economic distress? So do the, do the payment systems hold up against stress? Do, um, are there, you know, kind of day-to-day -day processes that we rely on that if, if one, pers one entity doesn't pay into it, the whole thing, you know, sets off a chain, a chain of chain reaction. So we want to understand those kinds of things. Do financial market participants and policymakers have a good understanding of how changes in the environment, um, including in the macro economy, and in, you know, are the new regulations that we're putting in <coughs> technological innovation, do we understand how they're influencing the, the sort of latent stability of the system? Um, and then finally, are there effective backstops in place? What do we know about, you know, the effectiveness of these backstops um, to stem contagion when shocks do occur? Because we do need, um, the contagion is costly, conditional on being in a state where there's a shock. Um, we do need backstops that stop things from spreading and from, from runs occurring. So, um, okay, so, so what I think the, the one important way to, or one way, potential way to look at this is to say, what can hindsight um, teach us about the risks that we face today? So um, as of 2005, if you had asked, you know, do private incentives and regulatory oversight, um, are they fostering accurate and timely assessments of expected return and underlying risk by borrowers and lenders? In 2005, I think a lot of people would have answered, yeah, probably, right? Like, yeah, close enough. And, and then I think as of 2008, we would have said, you know, no, it was absolutely not. We were way, people, people had no idea what they were buying. And these financial institutions are holding instruments that, um, you know, they expect, or holding assets that they thought they'd be able to sell off and they were relying on this assumption and this assumption's not true. So, and their, their capital as a result is much lower than we thought it was. Um, so I think, th again, this is the Greenspan-Bernanke difference, but you know, we kind of have to ask ourselves, how would we have known in 2005? What would we have wanted to look at in 2005 to understand whether the system was, you know, heading towards stability or heading towards instability? Um, you'll notice I'm not exactly answering that question because I think it's very hard. Um, and then, so in 2013, how would we answer it now? Where are we um, potentially, where are bubbles potentially forming? Where are asset prices distorted um, and not, I think that's, a, that's an, another question where you don't want to just look at the spreads and say, yeah, spreads are, spreads are low and so people might be taking on too much risk. You kind of want to understand what are the mechanisms? Where's, where are the banks making their money right now? What's generating fee income for financial institutions to offset low interest income? Um, what's the, you know, kind of what are the underlying things that are potentially driving the activity in the system and do those appear to be stable or are they kind of, you know, people signing contracts they don't understand. And I think that's, that's the way that um, we want to and do try to approach um, financial stability work more today. So if we apply the lessons, the lessons of the crisis to today, so the, the relatively easy part is identifying with hindsight what we got wrong in 2005. We now can give you a very, very detailed description of everything we missed in 2005. Um, the slightly harder part is identifying what, if anything, we could have done differently in 2005. And I would say there we still have not done a good job of explaining to ourselves what we would have done in 2005 that would have stopped 2008 from being 2008. I don't think we've really answered that question. And I think it's pretty much the whole question. 
Um, so that's, that's tr troubling. Um, and, and I think then the really hard part is envisioning ourselves in 2015 or 16, looking back on 2013 and saying, what do we wish we'd seen? You know, what was it that was happening in 2013 that we said, no, no, this is exactly what we want to see. It was, this is people getting, you know, back in the game and we're seeing a little activity and, and that in 2015 or 16 is going to be our bad news, right? So that's, that's I think, the, again, I think what's the, um, then doing financial stability work is identifying what steps, small steps, little incremental things on the margin we could take now to make the financial system more resilient to potential mistakes, to where we might be misreading the current state of the world. So how do central banks do this work? So some of it is quantitative analysis, um, including a lot of work devoted to trying to devise better ways to measure systemic risk. Um, and these are just three measures. I won't go into them in any detail. I just sort of put them in there for your reference. But um, three measures that, you know, researchers within the Fed, outside the Fed are working on to understand how you might depict um, a buildup in systemic risk, you know, in the financial system overall. And these are, um, they, these were illustrated in the 2011 FSOC annual report. I don't think they were in the 2012 annual report. I, l I looked for it and I didn't see it, but, um, but these are all still areas of active research of how do they, how do they capture the, um, I think one problem with some of these is they don't maybe give you much of a heads up on, on the buildup of the risk. So they might be a picture of the, of the risk, um, but it's not really necessarily a leading indicator of, of, a, of a potential collapse. But I don't know across each of these how true that is. Um, and then this was just a quote from that report that directly measuring this is challenging and there is no consensus. You know, and I guess obviously that's sort of obvious if there was one easy thing to look at, everyone would look at it and we wouldn't have the bubble. Um, so how, how do you do, um, what else do you do then besides trying to do this quantitative work? Um, you do risk identification, so you try to ask yourself where your diagnosis of a situation might be off, um, you know, because we think that uh, the low rate, ex periods of low rates are not causing, you know, we try to understand are they causing um, distortions in asset markets that maybe later are going to manifest in a bad way. Um, and our general thinking is no, but what if, what if, we're, what if we're wrong about that? Is our policy robust to the possibility of us being wrong about that? Um, or because we're just not seeing all the important parts of the picture. We regulate, regulators have, you know, not myopic, we're trying to be less myopic, but we still only have insight into a segment of the system. And, and I think financial institutions have every incentive to not have us see other segments, you know, so, the, so I think that's always a, a, a piece of this too, is just even understanding what's actually happening. And then are we internally in our processes connecting the dots between the insights we get from being on site at large financial institutions like we are, um, you know, the, the ones that we supervise, the insights we get from talking to market participants about what they're seeing in markets, do we connect them with those measures of systemic risk? Do we kind of say, do these things line up? Are people in institutions saying to us, you know, wow, we're making a lot of money on this thing that, you know, we just never expected would be such a, you know, profitable area, but it's gangbusters and, you know, who are their clients? How's that happening? Like, that's the kind of thing that we want to poke, we want to poke at more. And then we want to, you know, cross-check that with some of this quantitative work we're doing and vice versa. We want to use the quantitative work to help inform um, and understand what we're hearing in supervision and in market monitoring. Um, I think to do good risk identification, we need humility. So this is the, a quote by, by Tolstoy that I think is, um, is an important, important thing for all of us to keep in our mind as we do this kind of work. So the most difficult subjects can be explained to the most slow-witted man if he has not formed any idea of them already. But the simplest things cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he is firmly persuaded that he already knows without a shadow of a doubt, what is laid before him. This is unfortunately, you know, like a lot of people, that, la that, ladder, <laughs> that ladder piece, a lot of successful people, not all successful people, but a lot of, a lot of them. So, so that's, that's another kind of, of challenge, I think, in doing this. Um, so then there's risk mitigation. So that's risk identification. And mi mitigation is asking ourselves what steps we could take now to make the system more robust and resilient to us being wrong about how we're reading the world to events that we aren't even contemplating. 
So I don't think, I think a lot of times financial stability work gets talked about as like predicting the crisis or understanding if there's a bubble. But I think it's more about what should we do now that will make us, make the world more robust to the possibility we don't understa understand something. I think that's, that's more the um, essence of it, but uh, rather than trying to forecast whether something is going to go wrong or not. Um, okay, and then, so, so how am I doing on time? Five minutes, okay. So central banks, um, you know, including the Fed, are trying to identify stronger frameworks um, for identifying and, and mitigating risks. So we're working on improving our lender of last resort function and crisis management tools um, in keeping with the changes that Dodd-Frank put in place. We're developing new, new tools that are designed to prevent the buildup of systemic risk, and these are often referred to as macroprudential tools. Um, and we're trying to understand how to use these tools to actually achieve um, financial stability objectives, including, and I think this last line is important, how to make our supervision more preemptive. So we have, I think, in monetary policy, we have a contract, a social contract with the public it's understood that we will be preemptive, that we will not wait until there is inflation to raise the interest rate, or maybe in this case, so the <laughs> current situation notwithstanding. The, in general, we will want to raise interest rates before we see inflation. We will want to, um, you know, the, the idea would be to preempt it. To, so you don't, the burden of proof is not you have to show that you've already lost control of inflation before you can raise the interest rate. In supervision, I think we need to get we need to work on how we articulate that same kind of what's our contract with the public. When do we get to take action, given that there's uncertainty about the presence of a certain risk and given that, you know, these are firms with shareholders and we can't just be arbitrary and capricious in the way we approach it. But at the same time, we do want to be preemptive. So I think that's a, that's a framework that we have to continue to build. Um, and, okay, so then this last... This was just, I just put in, again, just to show, just to maybe in my own mind try to sort out that we have, we have a range of objectives. We have, as, a, as an institution, price stability, maximum um, sustainable employment, and then we have this financial system safety and soundness, and part of that is about the firms that we supervise, and part of that is about the rest of the system. And we have to, the, in doing financial stability work, we're really trying to think about how to use the tools that we have or the ones that we should be developing to, um, to meet all these objectives simultaneously. And, and I think that's, um, that's, this is all still, there's still a lot of work to be done here in understanding what that framework is. To get to, getting to something that's analogous to the kinds of framework we have for monetary policy, where we sort of understand the decision rules, we understand who makes the decisions and when they make them, I think we, ne we don't quite have that yet, even even central banks with policy committees, financial stability, like financial policy committees, um, are still trying to develop the, the framework that, for making these decisions. Um, okay, finally, then, then the F stocks. This is just, just to um, one of one of the things that Dodd Frank I think tries to overcome is a is a little bit of the mandate myopia that that is present in the in the regulatory community where individual regulators kind of look at their own, um, they, like, what, what, what they're in charge of, and they don't necessarily try to understand and line that up with what other regulators are seeing. And that, I think, was one of the, one of the causes of the crisis, was just an insufficient degree of um, understanding, you know, kind of cross-checking, that cross-checking I was talking about before, um, and in a systematic way. So, um, Okay, so it, I guess, the, you know, in critical areas in, in the, for the last crisis, housing policy, uh, reform of vulnerabilities in short-term funding markets like the tri-party repo market, these were all, you know, a, a whole set of vulnerabilities that maybe no one regulator had any purview to look at um, or any mandate to look at. They had a purview probably. Um, and so we want to make sure that these things are not slipping through the cracks. So I think one of the, the, the chief place that we're trying to do that is through the Financial Stability Oversight Council, this FSOC, um, and, and also a, a linked but um, a separate Office of Financial Research that's also within the Treasury. Um, and, and then a range of other changes in Dodd-Frank that are designed to um, mm -hmm. kind of address the, the risks of particularly large and what are known as too big to fail institutions. 
Um, the FSOC membership, I won't go through that, but that's, that's who's on the FSOC. And um, how does this work in practice? I don't know if you're familiar with it much, but so you can, you can look at the um, open, I think the open meetings are posted on their website. So they meet on a quarterly, at least on a quarterly basis. Um, they've been about every seven to eight weeks, sometimes more frequently, sometimes phone calls if something's, you know, more urgent. Um, there's always often a closed and open session of the meeting, to, and um, open sessions are open to the press and public. Um, so a live web stream, I forget if they keep those on the website or not, I don't know. Um, and then minutes are posted on Treasury's website. And then they produce the FSOC annual report that outlines kind of the current thinking on the risks to financial stability. Um, and that's a big interagency effort to identify risks and to recommend changes to respond to those risks. And here I'm just, I just put up, a, it's too much, I won't read it, but these are, this is the list of recommendations that came out of the 2012 FSOC annual report. Um, and they basically, in the areas of what are the kind of structural vulnerabilities, what are the vulnerabilities that are sitting, you know, potentially around financial institutions um, pertaining to housing finance, and two, you know, how are we looking at financial regulatory reform, and, and are we, where are we on putting in place the, the changes that are necessary to um, strengthen the stability of the system. That's that. 